final day of Pi Data. And we'll start right away with our first speaker, Hadi Abdi Khojaste, with his talk about knowledge distillation in which a smaller network is trained to mimic the output uh, of a larger teacher model. Um, Hadi has been working at the Delta Trade Group as a research and development engineer, and uh, he'll tell you more about the topic itself. Hadi? Thanks for introduction. Let's uh, give a, a warm applause for Hadi. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. Uh, as uh, that was a warm introduction, uh, my name is Hadi. I'm working uh, at Delta Trade Group. Um, been working in a um, industry around 10 years right now from uh, dedicated hardware programming to cloud-based uh, services which actually serve millions of users. Luckily, they are still in production. Um, Delta Trade is actually the world leading sports entertainment technology provider. We're offering uh, OTT live uh, graphics and broadcast solutions. Uh, I'm part of Delta Trade Innovation Lab. At the lab, we are uh, providing uh, different services to the units. Uh, around the group, so we uh, basically doing analytics uh, and uh, new technologies. Uh, I'm uh, specifically working and uh, analyzing the videos from our own uh, cameras in a sport venues uh, through the uh, streaming analytics and like understanding uh, the dynamics of the fields, and making statistics, and so on. Um, today. Um, we're actually uh, about to delve into the world of knowledge distillation, as you might know. And uh, we'll start by providing a brief introduction to the neural networks and transfer learning. Uh, we will explore various variants of uh, knowledge distillation. And finally, we wrap up with a straightforward example. So hopefully, during this talk, you can uh, have a bit of idea how it works and how you can apply it. And maybe after that, you can just go and read if you're interested more. So to kick things off, uh, let's begin uh, with the basics. Uh, we all know uh, the building blocks of neural networks. So as uh, you can see at the left bottom, we have the input, which is indicated by x. We will wait to them, and uh, as an output function, uh, we will soften them or filter them uh, uh, based on a summation of a weighted uh, x. So uh, stacking these nodes together uh, creates layers. And when we are stacking layers together, we will come up with a network based on the architecture. Um, it can have like building blocks in between, memories, and so on. Uh, but let's say uh, you will get something like this, which you have an input, and you will get the outputs uh, based on these connections and weights. Uh, and you are training this model, it means you're changing the weights uh, using your labeled data. So the output is trying to be like the, the same as the um, labels. So we are using a loss function to fine tune the models and parameters based on the like, label that we have here. So. Now, uh, let's discuss about transfer learning a bit. Uh, imagine you have uh, neural networks uh, like this. It's like a uh, web of interconnected neurons. Uh, let's say uh, you can have any architecture. Here we have, for example, CNN, convolutional neural network. You have a matrix of colors, which is an image. You will put it inside a network. And uh, after your calculation, you will come up with the probability of a classes. So the network is actually a classifier. Uh, you will put an uh, image of uh, something. Let's say the network is uh, fine-tuned on a general task of image classification. It can understand any objects. Uh, you will put an image. It will tell you whether it's boat or car or bike um, and the probability on them. Uh, based on the literature that we know, um, the first layers, like at the left side, um, trying to understand the low-level features, like where the borders are or uh, where the edges in the pictures are. And once you are going to the uh, uh, end of the networks, it will train mid uh, and uh, high-level features of the image. So uh, the last neurons trying to understand 
if it's boat or car. In the beginning, they're just like doing image processing, let's say. So um, before going to transfer learning, uh, imagine um, we have another task. Like you are about to understand whether there is a uh, bike in a picture or not. So you've got that network that I just uh, mentioned. It can understand any objects. But you are about to just solve this subtask, small task of from that like big task. So what, what we can do is actually keeping all the first layers. So still, we need to know the borders and edges. But maybe we don't need the last layers of high uh, level features. And we can even like discard the boat and car and just keep the bike one, right? So we'll just change the last neuron here. And we'll keep the rest of the networks. Maybe we'll train it in a, a small various unlabeled data as well. And it might work very well, as people shown before. All right? So uh, what we should do is just um, um, use uh, the same network for a specific task and making adjustments on top of it. Um, let's say you need to change the network uh, somehow um, for a high-level task. So you might uh, want to recognize different uh, various type of bikes, which you haven't seen in your image data set. It, it had like general bike. And still, this network can help you uh, in a sense that can do some mid-level and low-level features. But maybe you can just add few layers at the end to understand uh, what is different between bikes. I actually even don't know it when I'm seeing it in Amsterdam right now. It's like a 10 types of different bikes, right? So we can uh, still keep the power of network, but we can add uh, more layers instead of one neuron or one layer or like few neurons at the end, if it's, that makes sense. So that's uh, what I wanted actually to tell you. Uh, if I can change this slide, OK. Um, so but what if uh, we find ourselves in a situation where, uh, like this example that I told you, is actually overkill for a relatively a straightforward uh, task that I just told you. So you have a picture, you're just going to say if it's bike, bike or not, right? You don't really need a really big capacity to understand all the word and all the classes and then uh, classifying the bike, right? So maybe we want to uh, opt for a less uh, resource uh, intensity approach, like a smaller network which can fit uh, comfortably in memory or you want to host it in your edge device. So we, we already know this task is simpler. So we don't need that uh, big network to do so. So let's say um, this is where knowledge distribution comes from. Uh, the concept is to use a bigger network, so-called teachers, uh, to train the smaller, uh, so-called student network. So what the student network's going to do is actually copy the mechanism uh, of teacher networks, mimic the teacher network uh, as, 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 uh, as a source of truth. So once you have uh, something really huge, like a teacher network here, which can understand everything, maybe as a student you can go and just uh, learn a specific part of things that you want for your subtask, right? So let's visualize this process. So if you have a student network and the teacher network, uh, let's say teacher network is, the, is working on a bigger task. So we will feed the uh, training data to both networks. First, we will uh, train teacher networks for the training data. And then um, a, student data, a student network doesn't learn uh, from the ground truth labels. So it's actually. Uh, uh, rather than that, uh, it learns from the soft labels or probabilities predicted by the teacher network. And then 
uh, after your training procedure, hopefully if you had enough capacity in a student network, and I'm assuming you are also using the full capacity of your teacher network, uh, teacher does its best, you can come up with something, maybe at the same quality of a teacher. So uh, this process uh, allows the student model to grasp not what, or let's say, correct labels are, but also why the confidence behind those uh, labels are, right? Great. Um, but let's say you are about to um, train the bigger network, or, or let's say you have a bigger task. So you want, um, like, okay, you don't like to have a bike uh, or no like classifier. So this uh, network gonna distinguish various type of bike, as I said. Okay. So you didn't have it in your teacher, or maybe your task is even uh, more sophisticated than uh, various type of bikes. So what we are uh, going to do is, again, using the same knowledge, because starting from sort of random network might not be the good option. We already know the low-level feature. So what we can do in this case, right? So building up in the previous step that I showed you, uh, consider this scenario that I just said, right? So you have larger task. So in such cases, um, you begin uh, with the better initial point, and you can do the same. So again, you will put the training data in both networks. A student network first will train on the labels from the output of a, of a teacher network, and then uh, you will use the student network for your next task later on. Maybe you have some uh, a relatively a small sort of data set. So the network is already ready to understand what is in the image. So you will just train it and let's say fine tune it on top of your small label data. Great. But what if uh, your task is not uh, only the subtask of like general task is the combination of different tasks. So you need you need to again uh, train a complex network. So in uh, this case, imagine you want to also segment where uh, segment a bike, where the bike is, uh, what's the type of the bike, uh, and maybe even writing explanation in text. So you have different tasks, and you want to somehow, again, use this uh, knowledge from other teacher networks to somehow come up with uh, another network which does everything end-to-end. -end. So let's explore multitask distillation here. Imagine uh, you have this general task, and also maybe you have uh, sort of limited uh, data to train it as well. So we've got, uh, for example, this network which is segment the image, we have another network which is classify the image, uh, we've got another network which is maybe uh, localize the uh, objects. So we're gonna use all of this, this network for your source of truth. We know the various aspects of this task uh, are available online, so we will just employ multiple teachers as source of truth. So what we are actually going to do is interesting, instead of uh, combining the network data and labels, we will use again the uh, soft and labels from outputs of these models. So we will aggregate all the inputs together 
maybe it's only one image, or maybe you have text as well, so it's just a general uh, schema. So maybe you will just put an image. But the output can be the various predictions that you want, and these various predictions uh, are the ones that should be uh, trained on top of the outputs of that teacher networks. Great. So having understood the concepts, uh, let's get hands-on with the state for examples. I'm just going to show you how it works in TensorFlow. Uh, you can do it in any framework. Uh, and I'm just going to show you the things I uh, explained. It's not that difficult to implement in first step. So our first step is to load the TensorFlow. Uh, and for this uh, task, I'm using a toy uh, data set MNIST. So let's load it as well. And then um, we will need to change that uh, representation. So if you're not unfamiliar with the MNIST, is the handwritten uh, numbers. You've got 28 by 28 uh, uh, pixel images. And these image, images are showing the handwritten numbers, so for now we're, we're changing them from 2D to 1D array, and then we will uh, em embed them, like we will represent them like in a one-hot encoding, because there are the pixel colors of image, we will just uh, also uh, change the domain of the numbers from the input. So we'll, we will show the nine, if there is a nine as an example in your data set, so we will show it by zero to one, like, like that vector you'll see in the image. Uh, then uh, we define the teacher network. So this is more complex network. So let's say we have few layers, like five layers of neurons stacked to each other. Uh, so for that, we, we are using a dense network. So we'll just stack them together. We, will, we should also somehow uh, define the activation. And here we have the call. We will just stack them together. Um, in contracts, we need uh, the a student network. This is a compact one. So here you can see it only has three layers. So it's uh, more simpler than the previous one. We'll do the same, but for uh, with the same input, but the, uh, less layers. And then uh, we start by um, loading the teacher model. Uh, and defining some hyperparameters. Let's say uh, we should train it by a cross entropy loss uh, and optimize it by Adam. If you are using another version of TensorFlow, maybe you, you should use optimizers.legacy.adams. Um, but anyway, if you will fit, uh, compile and then fit the network, you will come up with some uh, accuracy like 97.82 in the test set. Uh, we suppose to have the same quality in a student. Let's see if it's worked right that. So I already run this code before, as you might guess. Um, and then once the teacher model is trained here, uh, we will freeze the layer of it. It means that because we, uh, during the training of an other network, we're going to get the prediction of this uh, network as a label of the other network, so we need to just freeze so-called freeze these layers, keep the ways and not changing them during the training of other networks. So we'll just freeze all the layers to keep it as it is. And then um, here is the critical part. So let's say the student uh, loss function is calculated based on the teacher model's outputs and not the true values that you have. So we should define our custom loss function here. So we will actually do the same. So we'll get the, out, get the output of a network and we'll put it in the loss function of the other one. So and we have like other hyperparameters like the epoch numbers and the batch size of the other network. Once you will fit this one, uh, as a result, and the validation accuracy of uh, a student is um, 9782, uh, nearly matching the uh, teacher's performance. But the tricky point is, uh, this is not the one that you should look if you are working with TensorFlow. You should uh, go and see the real numbers on the test set. 
so it's, it's relatively the same. So, but this network has less layers and less norms. Great, right? And let's take a moment to recap what we've covered so far. We delve into fundamentals, and I just show you quickly the various distribution learning techniques. Uh, and we've seen a simple practical uh, implementation. So before we conclude, I would like to also recommend some resources. What I showed you is a basic. So please uh, take a note, or I will just share the slide later with you. Uh, please go and read these ones. You will find out more about the backbone of these uh, techniques. It relates to your setup, what you are actually going to do, and the tasks. And uh, basically, if you have labeled data or unlabeled data or so on. And as a bonus, uh, for those who are seeking to quickly start, if you got the GPU, you can consider Torch this tool. It's a framework which simplifies this stuff. Uh, it's like high level written. So you can see the example here on finding the transform model for glue task. It's a text classification task. You will just call it, and you will put the input file as a config. It will load the teacher by itself, and it will train the student network for you to see. They got, I guess, um, around 20 new recent uh, techniques. You can just run them and see the differences if you like. And I guess I should say thank you all for today. If you have any further questions or uh, wish to connect, so I'm available after talk, and I'm also be happy to answer any questions right now. <laughs>